Okay, so uh, this morning's session is on, uh, is on uh, hot or not. We're not. It's not a website where we, uh, where we rate these guys for their uh, philosophical genius out of 10. Um, it's in fact about the, uh, the uh, higher order thought theory of consciousness, something which has been uh, very active in philosophical discussions of consciousness over the last few decades and has also increasingly uh, become connected to issues in the science of consciousness. Now, uh, this is set up in uh, debate format. The original idea was we'd have two philosophers and two neuroscientists, one pro, one con, from uh, each, uh, each group, each side. Now, as you see, we don't have four uh, participants here. We have three. Um, sadly, Victor Lama couldn't make it. He had a family emergency back in the Netherlands and couldn't come. But uh, heroically, uh, Ned Block has agreed to step up and play both roles. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, philo the, the philosopher and the neuroscientist, uh, having some, uh, some expertise on both. So uh, the way we're going to set it up is that uh, David Rosenthal will go first. Um, so on the pro higher order thought side, uh, 25 minutes. Then Ned will respond on the philosophical issues for 15 minutes or so. Then we'll have uh, Hakwan go for uh, 25 minutes. Then we'll have um, Ned, response, Ned respond on the neuroscience issues for 15 minutes or so. And we'll have a few questions along the way, open it up for discussion. Hopefully, we should have time for a good, uh, healthy airing of all the relevant uh, issues. Um, so uh, David Rosenthal, someone who needs no introduction at this uh, conference, has been uh, many times. I think first time was back in 96. Um, He's really the, uh, you know, the originator and prime mover of the, uh, the higher order theory of consciousness in many uh, important publications over uh, the last, gosh, 30-odd uh, years now, since, uh, since the 80s, when uh, the early work was uh, developed. And he's um, just developed into an extremely systematic um, theory with consciousness, with application to uh, um, pretty well any issue you like in the philosophy of consciousness, and then also being increasingly connected to issues in the science of consciousness. So recently, uh, David and Hakwan had an article come out in Trends in Cognitive Science on neurobiological issues concerning the higher order theory of consciousness. And he's, David's also been a prime mover in the philosophy and science of consciousness through all the work he's done with graduate students, you know, many of whom are here, through his work in organizing many activities in, in New York City, and so on. So it's a pleasure to have him here today to kick off the, uh, the pro higher order thought side with a talk called uh, Conscious Awareness, Higher Order Theories, and Overflow. So please welcome David Rosenthal. Is this coming? Yes, good. Thank you very much, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, all explaining. I'm going to argue must be based on a reliable, accurate description of the phenomena that we want to explain. Otherwise, our explanation may simply miss those target phenomena. Um, I originally, in a slide, had a quotation from Tom Nagel to this effect because I thought it would be good to have somebody disagreeing with me from uh, the other side, the polar disagreement, uh, making the same point. Scientific theorizing does often lead us to revise our take on the phenomena. So, for example, uh, it used to be perhaps that we thought that weight was an intrinsic property. We came to realize that it's a relative property. But regardless of this revising of common sense notions that sometimes takes place, we still have to take care to ensure that our explanations address the phenomena under consideration. In the case of conscious states, that means explaining how mental states that are conscious differ from mental states that are not conscious. Otherwise, we won't have said why it is that the conscious ones are conscious. This is a constraint on any type of theory of what it is for a state to be conscious. But this constraint on theories generally, we'll see, motivates higher order theories in particular, so that's what I'm going to turn to now. It won't do simply to say that we know perfectly well what conscious states are, 
from the inside, so to speak, from the first person, because that won't capture the contrast between being conscious and not being conscious. Experience is no substitute for articulate description. A neural marker that occurs only when states are conscious, the famous NCC, can be highly useful. But even such a marker cannot by itself explain why those states are conscious. We must also say why our neural marker results in states being conscious and why mental states aren't conscious when the neural marker is absent. Compare, we have to say not only that we have a macroscopic object that has a certain atomic structure, we have to say why having that atomic structure results in the distinctive macroscopic properties. Neural markers may point to mechanisms in virtue of which some mental states are conscious and others not. But we still have to explain why it's those mechanisms that result in a state's being conscious. That is to say, how those mechanisms make the difference between a state's being conscious and its not being conscious. We often get a useful handle on what a phenomenon consists in by seeing what's missing when the phenomenon is absent. That works well with consciousness. The salient mark of a mental state that fails to be conscious is that the individual who's in the state is altogether unaware of that state. If we have a reason to think that a subject is in a mental state, but that subject sincerely denies being in it, then the state is not conscious. We need sincere denial in order to indicate lack of awareness of the state. This implies that a state's being conscious requires that one be in some way aware of being in that state. And, and that's the core of any higher order theory of consciousness. Higher order theories hold that a state is conscious only if one is in some way aware of the state. Higher order theories differ among themselves about what that particular way is. On my own higher order thought theory, one is aware of one con one's conscious state by having a thought that one is in that state. That higher order thought need not itself be conscious, and to capture the subjective immediacy of the way we're aware of conscious states, the higher th order thought must not seem subjectively to rely on any inference or observation. But despite the elegant title of our session, uh, Hot or Not, I'm going to be discussing high order theories generally and the higher order awareness that they posit. And I'm not going to focus specifically on my own higher order thought theory. First order theories of consciousness, like Ned's, see a state's being conscious as independent of any substantive higher order awareness of the state. Um, the word substantive matters here. I'll come back to that in a moment. First order theories vary among themselves in the accounts that they give. Fred Dretzky, for example, provides a certain psychological account. Ned, as I understand him, provide, prefers a neural mark. But whatever the account, whether neural or psychological, the account must explain how it is that mental states that are conscious differ from mental states that are not. Mere co-occurrence of a preferred feature with the states that we count as conscious is not enough, unless that preferred feature also explains why the feature makes the difference between the states being conscious and it's not being conscious. One might urge that the higher order awareness that occurs with conscious states is not substantive, that it's in a certain way trivial. Maybe being conscious of a conscious state is like smiling a smile. This is an idea um, due to Ernie Sosa uh, that Ned has sometimes endorsed. But smiling a smile is simply smiling. So it can't provide a contrast like the contrast that we need between a mental state's being conscious and it's not being conscious. 
And I think that no such deflationary account of the higher order awareness can explain how conscious states differ from mental states that are not conscious. For that, we need a substantive awareness of the state. More on that in a moment. High order theories do not conflict with finding neural markers of mental states being conscious. Indeed, they may very well help guide the search for um, an NCC. That's because of the constraint that high order theories place that's a bad sentence. That, that's because the, the constraint that I've been talking about um, that I think any theory must meet. And so the NCC itself has to meet that constraint. High order theories reflect the observation that no state is conscious unless one is in some way aware of it. So a satisfactory NCC should point to or provide a mechanism that subserves or gives rise to that higher order awareness. Hockman and I have argued that uh, prefrontal cortex is likely implicated in any such mechanism, but on this occasion, I'm going to defer to Hockman uh, for the neural specifics. Instead, I'm going to turn to saying a bit more about why it is that higher order theories do constrain the search for the NCC. Why can't the search for a neural correlate of consciousness proceed altogether independently of the issues that divide higher order from first order theories? A state's being conscious is a psychological phenomenon. So a merely neural marker won't do unless it points to a psychological way in which conscious states differ from mental states that are not conscious. A neural correlate that explains why we're aware of mental states when they are conscious, but not otherwise, does satisfy that condition. But first order theories which preclude appeal to being aware of conscious states, at least in any substantive way, arguably lack resources to explain in psychological terms how conscious states differ from mental states that are not conscious. Why is that? Why can't first order theories explain that difference in psychological terms? Some first order, some people who hold first order theories uh, think, in fact, they can explain the difference. Since first order theories deny substantive higher order awarenesses, the only remaining psychological properties are those such as representational content, mental qualities, and attentiveness. And none of those helps, since they all occur with non-conscious states as well as occurring with conscious states. Non-conscious thoughts exhibit intentional content. Non-conscious mental qualities occur in cases like mask priming and other versions of subliminal perception. And uh, with a nod to yesterday's session on attention and particularly Bob Kentridge's presentation, attention also occurs with non-conscious states. So there's no first order account, or at least so I'm arguing, there's no first order account of a state's being conscious that's cast in distinctively psychological terms. For that, high order thoughts are arguably the only game in town. So some objections. Many theorists see consciousness as an inseparable aspect of qualitative states such as perceptions. But I think it's arguable that qualitative states can and do occur without being conscious. Subliminal perceptions, for example, those in mask cases, are not conscious in any ordinary sense. Nonetheless, such states evidently exhibit mental qualities. And my argument for this is that we distinguish subliminal states in respect of the very same qualitative features, say color and pitch for audition and so forth, the very same qualitative features figure in distinguishing subliminal states as figure in distinguishing among conscious qualitative states. So subliminal states, it seems, have qualitative character, and indeed we treat them as though they do. Since subliminal states do exhibit qualitative properties, is there something it's like 
perhaps something it's like for one to be in subliminal states. Do those states exhibit phenomenal consciousness? Uh, I confess I'm not sure, I think both these phrases, what it's like in phenomenal consciousness, have uh, wandered around a very great deal uh, in uh, the last 20 to 30 years in terms of how they apply, but I'm just going to push ahead. If subliminal states do exhibit something it's like to something it's like and phenomenal consciousness, then those notions of something it's like and phenomenal consciousness extend well beyond any ordinary notion of consciousness. People in subliminal states sincerely deny being in those states. So I think it's at best quixotic to regard those states as conscious. Intuitively, there is simply nothing it's like for one to be in such states. Since we do characterize subliminal states qualitatively, first order qualitative states can occur without phenomenal consciousness and without there being any what it's likeness. Uh, and I take that from Ned's analysis article last summer, that phrase in quotes. So those properties can't be an inseparable aspect of first order states. Ned denies this holding that phenomenal consciousness and what its likeness are aspects of first order qualitative states. At least that's my understanding of Ned's view. And subjectively it does seem as though that is the case. But our explanations must look past the subjective appearances. The high order awareness is rarely itself a conscious state. We are seldom aware of being aware of a conscious state perhaps only in the very special case of introspecting, which I won't be talking about today. Since we are typically unaware of any higher order state, it will seem subjectively that there's only one state, namely the first order state. So the property of that state's being conscious will seem, again, subjectively seem, to be an aspect of that one state, to be an aspect of just the first order state. High order theories can explain our subjective sense that the property of being conscious is inseparable from first order qualitative states. And we also have reason not to trust that subjective sense. Our best psychological handle on how conscious states differ from non-conscious mental states is that a higher order awareness accompanies the conscious states but not the ones that are not conscious. Any acceptable theory must, of course, do justice to the subjective appearances. But there are two ways to do that. There is one strategy of doing justice to the subjective appearances where you simply say the subjective appearances are the way it really is. And that's not the only way to do justice to the subjective appearances. There's a second and I think better way of doing justice to them. We can do justice to them by explaining why it is that we have those subjective appearances. And that's what we do with many, many other phenomena such as weight. We don't take our pre-theoretical conception of weight to be veridical, we explain why we have that pre-theoretical conception. And we're going to have to explain why we have, this is back to consciousness, uh, in the case of the subjective appearances, we're going to have to explain why we have those subjective appearances. And supposing that the subjective appearances are veridical or accurate isn't going to help us give such an explanation. This bears on an objection that Ned and others, I should say very many others, have raised. Namely, that high order theories don't preclude a higher order awarenesses occurring without any first order state that's relevant to the higher order awareness. That is to say, without the first order state that the higher order awareness makes one aware of being in. Uh, I have to confess, I've never seen that this can really be much of a worry, right? Higher order theories don't require that this ever actually happens. 
So if it turns out that we establish that it can't happen, we can just add a stipulation that it can't happen. And this is not ad hoc. This would just reflect what we have discovered, namely that it can't happen. But I think it can. Uh, at least I think it's unclear why a higher order awareness cannot occur without the first order states be, that one is aware of oneself as being in. It seems subjectively that that can't happen. But that shows it, it's, seeming, it's seemingly, it's seeming subjectively that it can't happen shows that it really can't happen only if we assume that the mind is transparent to itself, uh, which I think is still uh, a more common assumption than many theorists are inclined to acknowledge, uh, but seems highly implausible. And it will appear subjectively that higher order awarenesses cannot occur without their being, without their targets, since actually on a higher order theory, the higher order awareness is an, a subjective appearance that one is in the relevant first order state. So it's going to appear that way if you just have the higher order awareness without any first order state. If what it's likeness were an aspect of the first order state, as Ned holds, then there would be nothing it's like without a first order state. And that, as I understand it, is the basis of his analysis article last summer. But if one is altogether unaware of being in that state, then there will be nothing it's like for one to be in it. So having a higher order awareness is at least necessary for there being something it's like, and barring an appeal to the transparency of the mind to itself, I think it's also sufficient for there to be something that it's like. And as noted earlier, we can explain our subjective sense we can explain our subjective sense that what its likeness is an inseparable aspect of first order states simply because we're un unaware of most higher order awarenesses. But if a higher order awareness does occur without a relevant first order state, what is the conscious state? It's not the first order state since by hypothesis that's missing. And the higher order awareness, as I keep saying, is seldom itself a conscious state. Doesn't this show that the first order state must occur? It can't fail to occur because we have to have something that's going to count as the conscious state. No, I don't think so. Consciousness is mental appearance. What matters for consciousness is simply how our mental lives appear to us subjectively. A theory of consciousness has to explain that. So conscious states are simply the mental states that we appear subjectively to be in, even if occasionally we're not actually in them. Ned has argued in a different article that perceptual consciousness overflows cognitive access. Actually, uh, I'm referring to a Tix article uh, from last year but he's argued this in a number of places. And he appeals to George Sperling's work and also to Victor Lama's work. It's very sad that Victor can't be with us himself, but Ned will represent Victor's work. Uh, and he, he, Ned appeals to that work to argue that there is more, that's, to argue that more is phenomenally conscious than we actually access in a cognitive way. Ned is going to discuss these results in detail. I'm just going to very quickly describe Sperling's work and make a few comments. Sperling presented subjects very briefly with a three by four matrix of letters. After the letters have disappeared, subjects can identify only three to four letters spread out among the 12. But if a subsequent tone directs subjects to one row, so the letters appear, they disappear, then there's a tone after the disappearance. Then subjects get most of the letters in that row. Since the tone occurs only after the letters have disappeared, subjects must somehow retain the relevant information. And the question is, how do they retain it? Ned argues that they retain it consciously, appealing to Victor's work. 
My comments on Sperling will, I believe, also apply to Victor's work and to Ned's arguments. Sperling's subjects report having conscious perceptions of all 12 letters. But some theorists have urged that these conscious perceptions are in some way generic. For example, uh, conscious perceptions of some letter or other, but not a specific letter. Or perhaps that the conscious perceptions are fragmentary, pieces of letters, but not the whole one, not the, not the whole letter. The perceptions would then not overflow our rather limited cognitive access. Ned doubts that conscious perceptions are ever generic or fragmentary. But high order theory suggests that they may very well be generic or fragmentary. I myself am more drawn to the generic idea, but either one. Even if the first order perceptions could not be generic or fragmentary, I'm not conceding that, but even if that were true, that the first order's perceptions couldn't be generic or fragmentary, the higher order awareness might still make one aware of the first order perception in a fragmentary or generic way. The perceptions would be conscious as being fragmentary or generic. That's one point. Subjects also report that they consciously see, quote, more than they can con cognitively grasp. Uh, that's Ned's summary of these conscious report, of these subjects' reports. And quoting from a BBS commentary uh, by Sperling in 83, uh, subjects report that they saw more than they remembered. And Ned argues that this helps confirm that the perceptions that overflow cognitive access are conscious. Subjects say they are. But these reports may be indicating something different altogether. They may just reflect subjects' assumptions that the display that's out there, the objective display that they're presented with, contained more than they can identify, and so more than they were consciously aware of. They may just be assuming that the display had specific letters that they couldn't identify, and this would be an extremely reasonable assumption for them to make. Conscious awareness would then coincide with cognitive access, that is to say, it would coincide with what subjects can describe and identify. Those who deny overflow sometimes urge that conscious perception is sparse, less rich than it seems. Ned insists that it's rich. Perceptions could be rich or sparse in two distinct ways. I've been suggesting that perhaps the first order perceptions are in themselves rich, but we're aware of them in a sparse way, that our higher order awarenesses represent them sparsely. But it might be that the first order perceptions are also less rich than we subjectively think, independent of how we're subjectively aware of them. The first order perceptions might not be as rich as we think. For example, paraphobial vision is very much less rich than it seems subjectively to be. We likely do, I think, subjectively overestimate the detail we objectively see. That is to say, in a first order way, um, appealing to uh, somebody that Hakwan has uh, uh, worked with in his lab. If so, we have even less reason to hold that conscious perceiving overflows cognitive access. Thank you very much. Okay, so David, we have a. So we have um, we have time to take one or two questions. Oh, yes, one or two questions. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Jesse. I, it's over there. Uh, uh, thanks, David. Uh, so I need to get in here. So I want to ask you to Can I stand? I'll just stand here. Uh, let me, the people behind you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. So I wanted to ask you about the notion of explanation and work in the first part of your talk. Right. Um, First order theories, you suggested that first order theories uh, are not in a good position to explain. 
Yeah, it's, well, it's, 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 it's one question. Uh, you said the first order theories are not in a position to explain awareness, but you didn't mention availability theories, which seem to be in a good position to explain awareness, whereas higher order theories fail by your own standard of explanation, which is the possibility of having the, the state instantiated without awareness. After all, we can have lots of higher order thoughts without awareness. It's a particular kind of higher order thought that matters for awareness. So the explanation is sort of at another level of analysis, which opens up a large family of first order theories, uh, which posit special changes at the first order that might be correlated with awareness. OK, that's not a quick okay. <laughs> yeah, question. And it can't have a quick answer, but I'll give a quick answer. Uh, uh, availability theories, uh, for example, somebody might construe attention as the gateway to working memory. Uh, uh, you yourself. Uh, seeing attention as the gateway to working memory, this is uh, at the neural level. This isn't really a psychological level explanation, as I think. So uh, when we have more questions, we ha we're going to have plenty of time. Uh, why don't you ask that again, and I'll give you a fuller answer. But okay. that's the quick version. Other quick questions? Um, I see one at the back. Not so quick to get there. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, your, your entire argument rests on the premise that unconscious states exist. Uh, yes. for, for instance, I'm not aware of your consciousness, and yet I have every reason to believe you are conscious. So my question is, if polypsychism were demonstrated, do you if, agree if, that- I'm sorry, if what were demonstrated? Polypsychism, the notion that all of our supposedly unconscious states are in fact conscious, but just not us but other individuals, do you agree that your arguments would fall apart? I have no idea what to say. Okay. So could you maybe stand over there? I'm just worried that it's going to spill on this. Right. Um, why don't you put this over? Uh, I have no idea what to say about that. I guess I was assuming that we have something like a common sense phenomenon of uh, mental states, thoughts, perceptions, sensations, and so forth, and that we have perhaps a slightly less common sense conception of what it is for those states to be conscious. And it is an interesting fact that's often overlooked that the description of mental states as being conscious is, relatively speaking, a neologism as these things go. Uh, that, bef at least in English, uh, before the last quarter of the 19th century, uh, that phrase was almost never used. That the um, big guys that we talk, to, uh, talk about, like Locke and Descartes, who were very long dead, never used the phrase conscious state, conscious thought, anything like that. Always immediately conscious of. Uh, so I take it that we have a kind of contrast between states that we're aware of being and states that we have third person evidence that we're in despite our not being aware of being in them. And that was all I was addressing myself to. And there could be all sorts of theories about how that works that uh, might undercut what I was saying, but I was just starting with that common sense uh, setup. OK, we'll take one more quick one over here. Thank you. Yes, I'm not very good at the spurling task, but I've given it frequently to my psychology students. And, oh, they're very, and they tend to be very good at it. The very fact that in the partial report, you hear the tone 15, maybe even 30 seconds after it goes off, the fact that they can come up with 75% or whatever of whichever role they're doing suggests that they're seeing much more than just fragments or generic letters. Uh, again, I'm not very good at it, so I can't give a first hand, but, my, but I, can, I can say uh, that my students uh, tend to be very good at that. It suggests much more than just fragmentary things. So I, I, think, I think on that one, Ned's got you. Uh, it, well, I don't know about that. Uh, uh, I was talking about two ways of being fragmentary and generic. 
and what I was saying in connection specifically with Sperling is that they could be complete and not fragmentary, not generic at a first order level, but not consciously. And you could be aware of these first order states in a fragmentary or generic way. So I don't think Ned has me quite yet. OK, so let's thank David again. OK, so our next speaker is someone else who needs no um, introduction. Uh, Ned Block has been a major, like David, Ned, Ned Block has been a major contributor to the uh, philosophy and the science of consciousness for uh, many decades now, starting with his work on um, you know, functionalism back in the uh, 1970s, and work on qualia and representationalism in the 80s and 90s, increasingly in the last couple of dec decades, uh, connections to the science of, uh, of consciousness. So his uh, famous paper in the behavioral and brain sciences in the 1990s on, on a confusion about a function of consciousness has been extremely influential in uh, clarifying, distinguishing notions of consciousness, phenomenal and access uh, consciousness in the, uh, in the consciousness um, community. And in recent years, he's been uh, focusing a lot on connections between consciousness, attention, and representation. I believe, in fact, there's a, a book on those things that's going to be coming out uh, one of these days. Um, Ned's also got, uh, oh, also, uh, Ned's, Ned's also been, of course, closely involved with, the, been to the Tucson conference many times, been closely involved with the ASSC, and we're actually in the progress of, uh, in the process of setting up a uh, mind-brain center at New York University that Ned and I are going to be co-directing, um, which hopefully will have a number of activities relevant to consciousness stuff going on. Um, in recent years, Ned has been, uh, in the last couple of years, Ned has really been engaging the higher order thought theory in, uh, in detail. I published an article on analysis called The Higher Order Thought Theory of Consciousness is Defunct. Now, as, as I said to Ned at the time, it's a very bad move if you want to, you know, render a theory defunct to, uh, to uh, publish an article saying so, because then there's a whole bunch of people going to reply, and then reply in turn, and suddenly the theory is much less defunct than it was <laughs> upon, uh, upon starting. And I guess we'll seek another instance of that today. But uh, anyway, it's, it's a pleasure to welcome Ned Block. Um, so um, I, as you, uh, uh, I'm sure, have gathered, I, I'm, I'm on this session twice. So um, this is my armchair uh, mode. Uh, 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 so I go for 15 minutes, and then um, uh, hack one, and then I substitute for Victor Lamy. However, I do feel that although I'm doing the armchair stuff now, I should say something about the point that Bill Faw made, because it's going to set up the non So Bill mentioned that his students can get so you have the Sperling array, that they can get three or four from any given row, showing that somewhere in the visual system there has got to be um, high uh, capacity representations. You must be representing um, most of the, uh, for example, 12 things in the array. Um, and so David Rosenthal replied, Oh, I'm just talking about what's in consciousness. So that really does set up the issue. Because according to um, uh, the opponents of Victor um, and me, like, like David Rosenthal, all that specific information is unconscious. Whereas we, uh, uh, Victor and I think it's, mo think it's conscious. All that specific information, enough information to differentiate one of those letters from another or you know, this from this. So a lot of the argumentation then turns uh, on whether unconscious representations really can last a long time and be that specific. But that's the topic for my next uh, 15 minutes. So let me now move to, so I'm talking about two forms. So I'm not going to talk about my own theory, uh, except kind of in, a, uh, uh, in an indirect way. Instead, what I'm going to be contrasting is two different higher order theories. So the two theories are the one on the left, which is a, a probabilified version of the standard higher order thought, the idea that um, um, what makes a, um, um, 
for a conscious state of re seeing redness is a higher order thought to the to the effect that it's very likely that I see redness at two o'clock. By that I mean the, the uh, you know the clock face, two o'clock in the upper right corner. And then there's a first order state of red uh, 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 representing redness at two o'clock. So I'm going to contrast that with what I call a pointer theory. This is actually a theory that Hakwan has uh, favored in a couple of papers, um, which is that the higher order state is just probability more than 0.83 of, and then po a pointer to the redness. Now, the key uh, factor here is that um, in the case of the higher order thought view, the the, um, uh, the higher order thought picks out the first order state by some kind of intentional um, a directedness, and intentional in the philosopher's sense, meaning directedness or aboutness relation. Whereas the pointer picks it out by, some, by an internal relation. So a pointer in, in a computer simply has a, uh, the number of the register of the thing pointed to. So it's an internal functional relation. Um, so, um, um, let's see, I have to get this so I can see it. Um, so, um, uh, uh, now I'll say a few things about the advantage of, advantages that accrue to both theories. So, first of all, they both have a demystifying account of, as David Rosenthal mentioned, of um, what the difference between a conscious and an unconscious state is. It's just the the coming, the, uh, what makes a state, uh, if a state becomes, say we have an unconscious sensation of red and it becomes conscious, that higher order state just comes in. And the same advantage accrues to both the pointer version and the, and the thought version. Now, um, um, let's see, what is this? Um, so, um, I, so, the, so in, in that respect, the two views are tied. Now, I think this is too demystifying because I think that the, um, uh, there is, I believe in the explanatory gap. I think that we simply do not have an answer to the question of why, of what, why the neural basis of a conscious state is the neural basis of that conscious state as opposed to some other one or none. So. Um, uh, this seems to me to be too demystifying. I think we should be just as demystifying as we have the right to be. But nonetheless, these two are equally demystifying in that regard. Now, one motivation for the, um, uh, the higher order view um, is that, um, uh, David expresses, um, it says that no mental state is conscious if one is wholly unaware of being in that state. And I, uh, that seems to be to be a laudable um, uh, a view. And uh, it also adhere is a, a view that uh, 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 can be, that is an advantage of, the, uh, of a view that, uh, uh, that uh, no one has mentioned so far, which is the um, uh, self-reflexive view of consciousness, that each state has a, um, uh, involves a reflection on itself. So that view says that any conscious state involves an awareness of itself without any higher order thought or higher order pointer being about it. Um, so um, I, I think many views can, can uh, accommodate this, but so can these two. So it's a tie there. Now, um, uh, David mentioned a few times that um, it should be a condition on a theory of consciousness that it explain what the difference is between consciousness and non-consciousness. Now, I don't think the higher, that either the higher order thought or the higher order pointer uh, view succeed in doing that. And I think no theory succeeds in doing that at the moment because of the explanatory gap that I mentioned. And let me just describe why. So what is, what is it that makes a pain a conscious pain? Well, it's the thought about it, according to the thought version, or the pointer, according to the pointer version. But what makes that thought conscious? Well, if there's another thought about that thought. But what makes that last thought conscious is another thought about it. And eventually you run out because you can't keep having thoughts about thoughts about thoughts about thoughts about pain. So higher to thoughts in general cannot be conscious. But now we see that there's a problem. How is it that when you put an unconscious pain together with an unconscious thought, you get a conscious pain? 
I mean, what's the answer to that? I don't think the higher order thought or the higher order pointer theory has an answer. So I think ultimately, they're left with an explanatory gap just like every other theory of consciousness. There, and further, I should say there's a further problem, which is if somehow it's some kind of magic you know, generation of, um, um, of consciousness, then it looks more like a causal theory that somehow you put a, a, an unconscious pain and an unconscious thought together and it generates consciousness. That looks more like a causal theory than it does like a theory of the nature of consciousness. Now, if you have, if it's, if the higher order thought view is just a trivial semantic view, we call them uh, we call a pain conscious if there's a thought about it, then I have no objection. But if it's meant to be a substantive theory, then I think it simply does not answer the explanatory question. There's no explanation there. So moving back to the comparison, um, um, David mentioned the problem of what if the, uh, uh, the thought content um, uh, is one thing and the first order content is another, like redness in the thought content, um, but greenness in the first order content. So there's a, a, a conflict on the higher order thought view. But in the pointer view, there's no conflict. And the underlying um, um, uh, uh, problem here is that for the, higher, for the thought view, is if what's in consciousness is um, uh, what the first order uh, uh, state says it is, then who needs the higher order thoughts? But if what's in consciousness is what the higher order state says it is, then what's the difference between thinking you have an experience of red and actually having it? So the big problem is in the higher order thought view, but not in the pointer version that um, um, uh, there's two contents. That's, that's, the, that's the difficulty. And the, point, the pointer version escapes that. So that's a big advantage to the pointer view. Um, and as David mentioned, there's also a problem about what if the higher to thought says um, redness, but there's nothing there in the first order state. So this looks like a weird conflict. Um, and uh, uh, Dave uh, said, and he says here, and Josh uh, uh, Weisberg has also said, such confabulation also uh, sometimes occurs with the qualitative state we are conscious of ourselves as being in. Um, so erroneous hots will, in this case, result in there being something it's like for one to be in a state that one is not actually in. Now, if this sounds paradoxical, that's because it is. Um, so just to take an, a, a, an example, a version of one uh, offered by Karen Neander, imagine three triplets, uh, um, um, one of whom is in agony, one of whom has the taste of chocolate, and the other of whom has no first order state at all. They all have the high order thought that I am in pain. Um, and according to the, uh, the, the high order thought view, um, uh, they all have the same conscious state, uh, the same conscious, um, consciousness, um, namely the pain consciousness, even though one of them is actually taste, has the first order state of taste in chocolate. And this suggests that the higher order thought view is disconnected from why consciousness matters. Um, when, um, um, well, okay, maybe I'll leave it at that. Um, so this, in this case, the advantage goes to the pointer, which does not have this problem. Um, so here's another uh, problem that um, I, I've raised a few times. What if the higher order thought says, probably I'm seeing color at a certain location? Is that a conscious state you can have of just seeing color? Um, so that, again, is an ad advantage to the pointer. But what if the higher order state says, um, higher order thought is, I'm seeing red and not seeing red? Um, again, the higher order point, the pointer view doesn't um, 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 uh, have this problem. And that's an advantage to it. Now, what exactly is the problem here? Well, here's a way of seeing what the problem is. It's not so much that it's implausible that you can have an experience of being of red and not red, or you could have an experience of seeing a color without any specific color. It's this. It's consider the following higher order thoughts. I'm having an experience of scarlet. I'm having an experience of red. I'm having an experience of red and green all over at the same time. I'm having an experience of color. I'm having a visual experience. So the question arises as to which of these higher order thoughts corresponds to a possible conscious experience. Um, and I doubt that all of them do. I doubt that red and not red is a possible conscious experience. I doubt that 
visual, just having a visual experience corresponds with no specific detail, corresponds to a possible conscious experience. But that isn't really the problem. The problem is that whatever the answer is, it's not to be found in the cognitive thought system. It's to be found in the visual system. So the higher order thought view, which can't allow that you, you need to look in the visual system to answer this because what's in the visual system doesn't matter according to the higher order thought view. It's what's in the thought system that matters. Whatever's in the thought system determines consciousness according to them. But the visual system is where you should look to see if you could have an experience of a color that's no particular color, just the generic color. Um, so in this regard, I give the, the advantage of the pointer uh, um, uh, again. Um, and I, uh, I just quoting, quoting David, um, uh, since thoughts can have any content whatever, higher order thoughts can make us conscious of perceptions in respect of all the mental qualities of a perception, whatever their modality. The big problem is that that thoughts can have any content, whatever. And the, the, uh, the way to put it is, or way I like to put it is that there are fewer restrictions on what can be thought than on what can be experienced. And so there's just too many degrees of freedom in the um, higher order thought view. Um, but that is not a problem in the, in the pointer view. So I, I, I commend the pointer uh, uh, view to you. Um, here's another a problem with the higher order thought view is that as you can see on the left, my higher order thought can be about your first order state. Um, intentionality can point anywhere, but as I mentioned, the pointer in the pointer version of the um, um, higher order view is what it points to is, uh, depends on the system. So it can um, uh, pl plausibly only point within the system. This is a, a, uh, an, a version of an argument given by Alvin Goldman and Fred Dretzky. So the only way that the, um, uh, the high order view can cope with this is by putting ad hoc restrictions on the high order thought that they're not allowed to be about somebody else or if they are about somebody else it doesn't engender consciousness for some reason and that seems to me to put the the advantage clearly in the, uh, um, um, of the realm of the, the pointer theory. Um, so here is a, um, um, uh, uh, another uh, kind of a problem. Um, so according to Freudian theory, I'm not taking Freudian theory all that seriously, but I think uh, it's certainly a possible account, and you know, there's something to be said for it. Um, so I can have an unconscious desire to murder my father and marry my mother, but according to some versions of that theory, um, that unconscious desire is kept unconscious by um, monitoring mechanisms that have the, that take the the uh, that that take uh, that think that in some sense think that that desire is simply too problematic to get into consciousness, and so they actively repress it. So according to at least uh, one possible version of this theory, you could have an un that that repression could be done by a mechanism that, that, that in one way or another has an unconscious thought to the effect that the desire is shameful and must be repressed. But according to the higher order thought view, that would make it conscious. That would make the Oedipal desire conscious. So they require a, um, uh, an ad hoc, what I would regard as an ad hoc restriction on those higher order thoughts. Um, so there's, in, in the case of the pointer theory, there's no um, reason to postulate those um, um, uh, 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 unconscious uh, 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 pointers. So I think it, it avoids this problem. So, um, um, uh, so I think I'll just stop here. That I, I'm going to next move to um, the um, um, out of the armchair, but uh, uh, for now I'm having my, my brief um, um, armchair moment, so that's going to be the end of it for now. Uh, so Ned, as long as you are using under the functionalist umbrella, you're using pointer, which of course is a computer programming metaphor, you're believing that with the pointer mechanism, you're gonna stay within the system, but don't you also open yourself up to the opportunity for a memory leak, and therefore for what? a memory leak. Memory link? A mem leak, L-E-A-K. 
where, you know, where, yes, today, you know, it used to be when people were programming in C with pointers, uh, they would mismanage their, their pointers and they would have memory links and our, our programs would crash all the time. So it would just seem that that becomes a possibility where you may actually branch out beyond the system of the, where the pointers should reference. So the idea is you might have a, a mistaken pointer. Well, on that theory, that whatever it's pointing to would then be a conscious state. Look, I don't believe either of these views. I'm just pointing out that, um, that the pointer version is better than the higher order thought version. I think a, a, a better views are the one, uh, 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 are the, um, the source of view that talk of awareness, what, when you, when, you, when you talk about a conscious state in a way that makes it seem that they have to involve some awareness, um, one point of view is the self-reflexive view that every state uh, uh, has included in it its awareness of itself. But another possibility is the uh, Sosa view that um, it's like smiling one smile. We speak of a state of consciousness as involving awareness, but that's just a way of speaking. So I'd be happy with either one of these views. I'm a first order theorist. Now I also believe that there is something you could call higher order monitoring consciousness, which is a way we speak when we do have a higher order state about a first order state. So I think that's just an independent kind of consciousness that's not phenomenal consciousness. Okay, I will take uh, one more. Okay, uh, here. Here. Um, I'm not. I'm not. Thank you for giving me a chance. Well, I don't understand much on uh, psychology, but um, from a neurological point of view, I can take your last comment here you say that intentionality uh, can go with any pointers and needs a system. Then uh, the new theory that we are uh, explaining a conscious act is by a system which is composed of the brain, the heart, and the effective organ. This makes a, a closed system in which uh, intention is the focal point and which is trigger a conscious act by signaling information from the heart to the brain and the feedback mechanism will produce a conscious act. And here is what emerges is a conscious state. And conscious state is a, a, not a continuous as a, Professor Stuart Hart mentioned, and also another um, guy, they said that it's a momentary, it's a point, it's not a continuous, it's, a, it's a states, you know, that a continuum uh, will produce the consciousness. Thanks. So I'm not sure I got all of that, but uh, uh, one part of it is that there's a continuum of consciousness um, and that the, the higher order view, I guess, can't accommodate that, which seems to me to be right. The big problem with the higher, higher order view is it imposes a grid of, well, certainly in the case of the higher order thought version, it imposes a grid of conceptualization on the first order state. So I think first order, uh, the first order consciousness, first order phenomenal consciousness is much richer than um, the higher order view of consciousness can acknowledge because for the, from the point of view of the higher order theory, consciousness is only as rich as our concepts of it. And I think our concepts of it are relatively sparse. So I guess to the extent that I understand, I completely agree. I think consciousness is richer than the high order view would acknowledge. Thank you. Um, OK, so our, uh, our next speaker is, uh, is Hakwan Lal, from, uh, who's a neuroscientist at uh, Columbia University. As you can see, this is very much a, a Manhattan, hot or not, uh, session between uh, New York University, uh, CUNY Graduate Center, and, uh, and Columbia uh, University. Uh, Hakwan actually got his start in philosophy as an undergraduate in uh, Hong Kong before going to uh, Oxford and doing his DPhil in neuroscience. He's done uh, since um, 
both in his work at Oxford and, and London and since moving to uh, Columbia, he's done all kinds of uh, influential work on, uh, on the, uh, you know, the, basically the neuroscience of, uh, of consciousness, of uh, signal, uh, applying signal detection uh, theory to uh, all kinds of stuff about conscious versus unconscious perception. Um, and in, he's also kept up his, uh, his philosophy angle in co-authoring the work with uh, David Rosenthal. It's also worth mentioning that he's a, he's a mean guitar player in the, in the New York Consciousness Collective, um, which occasionally gets together to, to uh, you know, perform New York versions of the, uh, of the zombie blues and other, uh, other numbers. Perhaps, if we're lucky, perhaps by the end of the conference we'll uh, get to see uh, some, um, uh, some of Hakwan on, on guitar. But for now, it's uh, explaining away phenomenological overflow, so please welcome Hakwan Lau. All right, um, so thanks Dave, and also thanks Ned for endorsing my view of consciousness. Uh, I know you don't, but... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 that was not so, an endorsement. So, that was a I, relative endorsement. Let, let's not indulge in the details. Uh, so my, my job is uh, to... I mean, I, I sometimes do, do get into the philosophy side, and, and, and David and I don't always agree on the details, but I think the, the broader picture that we are trying to, to get at is really about higher order theories in general, amounts all the insider disagreements aside, uh, how, how does it distinguish itself from, uh, from first order theories, which is really our common opponent. So the, uh, the plan today is to uh, review some very basic, very quickly review some basic evidence in support of high order theory. Uh, and basically there are plenty of them and we recently review them, so I'm just gonna quickly go over them. Uh, some of these, most of these evidence, even in the, in the review paper recently we wrote, uh, is really from my own lab. So it's a suspicion of some bias. I do those experiments to try to prove my own view. So, so this is something that I usually say in the end of a, of a talk, and today I try to say it up front. That this is basically some evidence you can think of as a larger neuroscientific community that actually there's a lot of evidence from there. Other people who don't even want to talk about consciousness will never come to these conferences. In fact, if you try to understand what they mean, they actually are also in favor of the high order view over the first order view. And this, I think this point is often underappreciated. And so given this kind of mounting evidence for the high order view over the first order view, then, then why do we still have this debate? I think there is in fact a problem that we all touch on already, which is the problem of phenomenological overflow. This, I, I do acknowledge it, it, it's not, not, it's not completely done deal, but, but either way is, is somewhat of a problem for both sides of us. And I'll try to address that and finally offer a solution to how we can understand overflow uh, within the context of high order theory or first order theory or any theory. As I hint at the title, basically my, my approach is to try to explain it away. I'm not gonna think that there's actually overflow, but there is an apparent phenomenon of overflow and how do we explain it away? So the basic idea, so, the, the, the form of high order theory, thanks Ned for pointing out, my, 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 the, the version that I like is, is not necessarily the same as the high order thought view that David likes. But overall the idea is, is simple, is that you have something called first order representation, which is what neuroscientists just call you know, sensory representations. They are in the sensory cortex. So, so if you, if you t take like a, a visual qualia, a visual uh, conscious percept, then we are talking about the visual neurons that fire in the visual cortex in the back of the head. And that's first order. But what higher order view sets is that is not sufficient. You need something on top and above that that is not in the sensory representation itself, that is some other representation to enable the, the first order representation to become conscious. And that is basically the higher order view, uh, regardless of the details. And there is a lot of evidence supporting this view. In particular, many of us like to interpret the higher order system or mechanism as being in the prefrontal cortex or parietal cortex. And if you take that, then a there's a lot of evidence for that. But I'm talking about something that is more specific. In particular, in my own experiment, sometimes I use, for instance, metacontrast masking to control for task performance so that your basic task performance is the same. Let's say you're discriminating a, a square or diamond. You're equally good in two conditions. And in one condition, you subjectively think that you're more conscious. And the other one, you subjectively think that you're more guessing. If you compare those conditions, then you find very specific difference in the prefrontal cortex. So I'm not just comparing, you know, conscious seeing versus basically 
not seeing anything. I'm comparing very contrived and very, very carefully matched condition where the signal is basically matched. Your visual signal is basically matched, and yet you get a subjective difference in your conscious awareness, and that difference is in the prefrontal cortex. And we can test it in patients. So in blindside patients, again, you can have a complete, complete knockout of conscious awareness, and yet you can perform the basic discrimination task. And again, if you compare under performance match conditions, the difference is in prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex as well. And if you use TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, that is a magnetic field to zap this brain area, then actually you can selectively impair the subjective report of awareness without changing the ability to do the task. So it seems to be pretty clear that there is a first order representation in the back of the head that supports the signal, the, vis the visual signal that represents the, the capacity of visual information. And then there is a higher order system, presumably in the prefrontal cortex and maybe parietal cortex, that does some sort of thing to allow you to appreciate how much signal you have, which is a kind of higher order awareness that uh, David was talking about. Presumably, that, that is the mechanism for consciousness. So the critique, I mean, the, the evidence seems to me very clear, and the critique has always been the same, is that Ned would say, well, you're really talking about report, right? This is really not awareness. This is a kind of higher order mechanism for report or metacognition. So the prefrontal cortex certainly goes with these reports. Uh, this is, if you deny that, that's pretty crazy, because from the visual cortex, you need to get to the motor cortex to report, and this, the standard mechanism is go via the prefrontal cortex under these kind of situations. But they say, well, this is just a report. This is not really the conscious percept itself. And this is where it comes in is, is useful to consider what a broader neuroscientific community thinks. And I, I think this is a difficult point to make. This is a, this is a small conference we have here. I mean, by any standard, it, it's getting bigger. It, it's very nice. I like this conference. But there are bigger conferences out there, like Society for Neuroscience, like uh, Computational and System Neuroscience conferences. And I think f a few of, only a very few of us go to those conferences. And those people who go to those conferences tend not to come to these conferences because they think we are stupid, you know? They actually think that we are crazy. We talk about this crazy stuff. So they don't, love, they don't like to talk about a consciousness C word. They will never interact with physicists. They will never interact with philosophers. So I, to me, I think is a, is a big arrogance on their part, but it would just be as foolish for us to ignore them because they ignore us, because they actually represent the state of the art of neuroscience. And if you take what they say, then it's obvious that in the last half century of research, it's very, it's very, a very basic consensus is there is no perception without a decision-like process. It doesn't make sense. If you tell you that well, you have 50 spikes in your visual cortex, they will say, well, 50 spikes, so what? You have to know what is the baseline firing rate. You have to know what is the fluctuation of your firing rate. So if you give me 50 spikes, it could be noise, it could be signal. So you need some sort of decision mechanism to decide that. And going back to as, as, as early as half century ago, signal detection theory, the basic tenet is exactly that. There is no such a thing as a, a threshold for perception. You have some signal in the brain, and in every trial, you set a criterion to decide whether that you, you're consciously perceiving or not. And you think about the more recently popular models like diffusion model, drift diffusion model, Bayesian models, they're all the same. They all talk about perception as an, in, a, a part of a decision process. Without a decision, there is no perception. You can't just say you have some signal in the brain and then you have perception. So this is just an example from one of the papers in Nature and Neuroscience by, by Alex Poche's group, which is the, one of the cutting edge for, for talking about how, how neurons are, represent things. And in every of these papers, in, in different approaches, there's always a sensory code in the back of the brain, and that code needs to be decoded. So sensory code is complicated. In order for a sensory code, is a population code. It's pretty complex, probabilistic, it's noisy. For you to translate that into a percept, you need to decode that. And the decoder is commonly understood if you go to Society for Neuroscience, if you, don't, if you disagree, it's very hard for you to make any friends, basically. Everyone thinks like that. The, the decoder basically is a frontal and parietal codices. It's hard to count how many nature and science papers have been on this in the last 10 years, mostly from Shadlands Group and Unglider, and, and most of the big labs in the, in the neuroscience community now basically believe that this is so common that it's no longer worth making this point. And I'm not just talking about you know, a, a readout mechanism for you to do the task. This is often the point that Ned would make. You, you, just, you need a readout mechanism to do the task. It's not just that. I mean, again, doesn't mean this is right, but this is what the state of the art of neuroscience community to basically think. You need the readout for perception. Without the readout, you basically don't perceive. So this is another paper by one of the colleagues of, of Ned, actually at NYU, uh, Tony Mushon, a highly respected uh, neurophysiologist and computational neuroscientist. This is a paper in Nature showing that 
basically you can you can have perceptual illusion there's conscious perceptual illusions happening at the decoding stage and this is a task i don't want to go into the details because of time but basically they're trying to do some psychophysics to manipulate something that can only happen at the late stage that is the decoding pres presumably frontal parietal stage of processing and that leads to a conscious illusion so most of neuroscientists actually believe that conscious perception is is a, is a product of these kind of late stage, higher order pro processes. But of course, the same critique can come back. You can say, well, you know, it's the same critique. All is very well. All these famous people, they believe that. So what, right? So it's still the same point. PFC may just reflect reports, and report is not awareness. And it's the same point. I'm sitting critique too, but it's the same content, but it doesn't mean to really say that NET doesn't have a point. I think NET has a very good point here which is about the problem of phenomenolo phenomenological overflow. And the problem, Actually, David, am I too close to the microphone? This is better? OK. Oh, that's e easier for me, too. OK. So, um, so the idea is that David already talked about this. Uh, in, in this case, is, is a Sperling example. I'm going to go over other paradigms as well. But basically, in the Sperling case, you, you're being presented with an array of 12 letters. And then if I ask you to, uh, very briefly, and then af afterwards, if I ask you to report uh, uh, all of them, you can't. It's very difficult, right? If there's no queue, you just want to report all of them. You can only report a few, and then you, you kind of you, you fail. But if I queue you after, after this is on, after the main display is gone, and then I present you a high tone or low tone or mid tone to queue to which row to, rep to, to, to report, actually, you can report just as well in any row. Not always perfect, but near perfect. So that shows that you actually somehow has the representation of all 12 of them. And this is back in the 60s. Originally, it's called iconic memory. OK? So originally, Sperling did it. And it, it wasn't about consciousness at all, just that it's iconic memory. And I take it as a very, very established fact that we have iconic memory that is pretty large in storage. And Ned's point is basically this, is that, well, if you ask the subject, so somehow the, the point is a superficial flavor and saying that, well, we are showing that awareness is more than report. We should discard those reports. All those prefrontal evidence that I show you and about what the community believes is all about report. But in the end, you also need some sort of report, right? You can't have no report. I mean, no, if you have no report, you, you do not know what the, what the phenomenology is like. You appeal to some report. What I think is just a more informal and more fussy kind of report. If you ask the subject, at least some subjects, such as Ned himself, would, would, would say, well, I consciously represented the identities of all 12 letters, but I couldn't report them all the time. Because all, at the same time, because reporting them is, you know, take a different mechanism. By the time I, re, I reported four, I started to forget what are, the other, what, are the, what are the others. So the view is that in the back of the head, in a visual system, you have all 12 letters, the identity of all 12 letters, and which I also, also think in some ways is true. But that thing is that you consciously represent all these 12 letters, and your access is only four at a time. And this is a pretty nice view. And if it's true, it does, it does suggest something that you have consciousness in the back of the head, and then there's a bigger capacity, and then your prefrontal access system has a smaller capacity. So what I'm always talking about, those, uh, what, what the neuroscientific community believes and all, all the experiments of mine, they are just at, they're just getting at this part of the access. They are not really getting at this higher capacity posterior uh, visual correlate, which is actually all in the visual cortex could well be first order. And I think this view has a problem, right? Because if you take, again, what people actually believe in the field and people do these experiments, those especially particularly people who do the experiment but never come to our conferences, they actually think that this view is very problematic. The reason is, I'm going to show you evidence in a bit, that when you do post queue access, that, uh, that is, after the array is gone, if you get a tone to queue or to access, it actually works like attention. So it's not quite like that you can just read out what is already there in the back of the head and, and carefully read it out without changing the content. We know that attention changes the, the nature of the sensory representation itself. So that is, you cannot have this very nice divide that you have 12 things here and four things there. By the time you read these four things, you are influencing the 12 things in the back of your head. So this is how attention works. Everybody believes that. And another principle of attention comes from bias competition, which is, again, one of the most influential principle of att attention, recently has been formalized as, as a principle of normalization. The idea is basically whenever you attend something, the things that are not attended gets punished. So essentially, the post queue access punish the unqueued stuff. So when you get queued to one, one row, the other rows get punished. So therefore, you actually never have a capacity of 12. 
take an analogy, you have a dinner ticket for tonight. You can use it yourself. You can give it to your friend, right? So you could have used it, your friend could have used it. You can say, well, so either me could use it, my friend could use it, so I have a capacity for two, which is not true. Your ticket allows only one person to go in because when one of you go in, the other person couldn't. And likewise, it's exactly the same situation here. You have 12 letters there, but they're not conscious. In order to make four of them conscious, the other ones won't be conscious. So the basic idea is that Christian Ruff, uh, who was, was my former colleague, actually did this study, and basically a Sperling-like study, and you cue them either to some stimuli on the left side or the right side, and using a very similar uh, um, Sperling-like paradigm. So you have a Sperling-like paradigm, you present the stuff, and then you take it away, and then you present a cue. I'm talking about here, because I have two sides, I can't use a, a pointer. So use, trust my cursor here, I hope you see it. And there's another condition which you cue beforehand, which is a standard attentional cueing paradigm. You cue to the left and you present a stimulus, you reply to the left. And as it turns out, in terms of brain activity, they are very similar. So here I'm taking a blob that is from the left hemisphere, and the left hemisphere represents the right visual field. So, so if you get cued to the left, Oh, sorry, this is, a this is the right hemisphere, which represents the left visual field. And if you cue to the left, which is the blue bars here, you can see that the act activity get boosted to the above zero. So when you cue, and, and this is the precondition, this is the postcondition. This is this this bar represents you cue them before. This bar represents you cue them after. It basically looks similar. I mean, in fact, if you statistically analyze it, they, they look identical. What is also interesting is when you get cued to the right, that is cued to the other side, there is an active deactivation of this activity. That is, for the things that are not cued, they are being actively pushed down. And in fact, this is not just in this single experiment. This is a principle of normalization that happens in attention and presumably happens in every stage of cortical processing in the brain. Again, this is like, I'm not cherry picking. These are some of the most standard papers. In fact, they are from, from Ned's department. This is, again, from NYU, from David Heger's lab. So the idea of normalization is you always normalize the sum of activity down to a constant. So when you boost the attended, you punish the unattended. So the unattended is not, it, it just doesn't fade away. It's not like you have 12 things here, you access D4, and by the time you access these four, the other eight just like, you know, naturally die out because you run out of time. You, you only can access them sequentially. It's not like that. It's that whenever you access these four and make them conscious, the other, four, the other eight will be necessarily will be punished to be unconscious. The signal goes down. It's a principle of how the brain works. So if that's true, then this, this view is really problematic, right? Because this is, first of all, you don't really access as if you just read out from there. You're influencing as you're accessing the back of the head stuff. And, and as you're doing it, you actually undermine the capacity of consciousness. So you, you, you have 12 letters that are potentially represented. You have the information. I'm, con I'm not saying you don't have it, but I'm saying that you don't have a conscious capacity of 12. You never could be conscious of all 12. And that's my take, so this is a resolution. You are not consciously representing the identity of all 12 letters, but somehow, I have to explain this data, right? So I take it that this is a report as well. So I like report, as a scientist, I think that without report, you can't do, you can't do consciousness science. Ultimately, you, have, you need to have some estimate of the ph phenomenology. So why isn't this report good? Some subject do say that. You, you consciously re represent all 12 letters. And here, already, have, we have a problem. We have one subject, Ned, who thinks that you consciously see all the identity of all 12. And you have some other subjects who don't, like, like David, who think that, no, I just see 12 things. I never see them as conscious letters. Uh, as, I, I never see the identity. So something is going on. And here, I'm going to offer you a, a, an idea that is basically you mistakenly think that you see all 12 letters. And it's not just I'm saying it's ad hoc. There's a principal reason why you consistently would mistaken this. And here's the data from my own lab. Rodnaf has already been talking about. It's a paper that came out last year. It's a psychophysics paper, so it's a little technical and dry, so I don't need to go through that. But I basically represent things. You cue them to one, one, one location or another location. If we, as in psychophysics, we nerdily, geekily control for everything, such as capacity, stimulus, etc. What we found is whenever you don't pay attention, you have a liberal detection uh, threshold. That is, you're more likely to say yes than say no when, you pre when you're presented with something. Even though you're not better, you're not seeing the thing more clearly, but you just tend to have a bias to say yes. So if I present you nothing in the blank trials when you're doing false alarms, you just produce more false alarms when you don't pay attention. And it's likewise, if you ask you to discriminate what the thing is, you would rate confidence that is higher than it should be when you don't pay attention. I'm not even showing you the data because I asked you just to introspect and think about your everyday life. It has to be true. 
That's why when the first time you miss the gorilla, if you don't know what it is, forget about it, because otherwise you will never be able to see it for the rest of your life. But if you have seen the gorilla, think about how surprised you were. You thought you would have seen the thing when you miss it. Even though you are very poor at seeing the gorilla, you actually thought that you would have seen it because subjectively you inflate how much you see. Likewise, for peripheral color, think about go back to your high school textbooks. You shouldn't be seeing that much color in the periphery. Your cone cells are centered on the fovea. So your peripheral vision should be black and white. I mean, maybe not completely black and white, but should be more or less black and white. But if you think about it, before I mention this point, I go through my life thinking that it's pretty even. There is something weird about the unattended background or periphery that we constantly inflate how much we see. We're mistaken how much you see. You actually don't see that much, but you, but you think that you see more. So this actually turns out to be a very nice result because we put it in psychophysics. We can model it in, in, in computational model. Again, the details are not important. If you, for some of you are physicists here, it's basically a very simple trivial case of stochastic resonance. So basically, you have a threshold that is fixed. Assume that you have a fixed threshold. If you have a, stable, you have a signal that is very stable over time, that might, be very, that might represent very good quality of information, but it doesn't cross the threshold. But now if you inject some noise to the signal, which impairs the signal to noise ratio, it can make it cross the threshold sometimes. So this is exactly a case of attention reducing the variance of the data. So when you don't pay attention, you have more noise in the system. And more noise means that you have low capacity, but somehow it promotes a detection bias and promotes a, a bias for high confidence. So we have the computational model. We tested it. It's not just like one piece of work. I mean, this, this, this phenomenon I'm talking about has been replicated at least 10 times over the last two years in my lab already. And we also have indirect evidence. We use TMS and inject noise in the system to try to test this model principle. So far, it works. I mean, it's from my own lab. Again, I'm, I'm biased, and you may not believe me, but so far it seems to work. So this is the idea then. Then you basically, you think you consciously represent all 12 letters, but you really didn't. You only think that you did. And this is not an ad hoc way to, 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 to write, to, to explain away the data. There's a very principled reason behind that, because you overestimate how much you consciously see, just as in the subjects in my own experiment in, an, in a totally different context. So that's why other people would think, oh, I, I think I see all 12 letters. Forget about that. Introspection has known to be fallible. In this case, we have a very good principled way to tell you why you are definitely fallible here. So Ned, in some other occasions, would prefer, or I think almost concede that maybe the Spurgeon paradigm isn't the best. There are other paradigms that might work better. And he prefers to talk about the Amsterdam paradigm that he may talk about in a minute. I'm going to roughly talk about that. I think that actually turned out to be the weakest paradigm to show this kind of uh, overflow phenomenon. And in fact, a stronger paradigm might be the Brockmo and the Lolo paradigm. I'm going to go through them very quickly. So in the, in the, in the Amsterdam paradigm, it's basically very similar. It's, it, the idea is from Sperling. But what they did, it is, instead of identifying the letter, they did change detection. So they show you an array of, of eight tri rectangles. And then after they show you a different array after a blank. And then they queue you. And then if they queue you only after, then you're actually pretty poor. Your performance is like 60%. Your, your job is to tell me whether the, the, the pointed to, the probed uh, at rectangle has changed orientation or not. And then in another case, I can, I can kill you way beforehand, just like an attention task. Then your performance is 100%. This is like in change detection. If I tell you this is the thing that's going to change, it's very easy. And the third case is I present a queue in between. So I present the first array, and then the first array is gone. And then I present you a queue, and then you have, to, you have to look at, you have to tell me whether this location has a change or not. It turns out that this works pretty well. It, it works like 90% correct. And then the argument is just as in Sperling is, well, this is gone, right? The first, the first array is already gone. How come if I kill you after, you can still do this task? So clearly, you represented all these eight things in your head consciously. The idea is change detection wouldn't do, because change detection could be done unconsciously. There is a lot of evidence for that. And Ron Rensing originally has, has called it like mind slide. You can have a hunch of a change without actually seeing the change. So maybe you didn't actually consciously see this change. That's why I think the Amsterdam paradigm is actually the weakest if you want to make an argument about, about consciously holding this stuff. So, so Ned's point is that you consciously hold these eight items online while this is gone. But I said you don't need to because you only need a hunch. If this, if this representation is completely unconscious, you would do just fine. In fact, from Victor Lama's own lab, there is evidence that you do it unconsciously, at least partially. So in another experiment, they do not eight rectangles now. So there's eight items, natural objects. And after they do the change detection, they are required to identify the pre-change object. So the idea is if they were doing it consciously, if they actually saw the first guy, 
the first array, all eight items, and hold the eight items online, and then they do the detection. After successful detection, they should be able to tell me, okay, you, you said that this change is correct, but tell me what was it before that. You should be able to do it perfectly, right, if you consciously see it. They don't. They do it at about 70% correct, and it's an afford alternative. So it's not, so they, they, have, they have some idea, but it's not very good. It's fragmentary. So I think this paradigm is weak. Another paradigm I think is very strong, actually. It's very good, and uh, Ned talks about it sometime, but not all the time, which is an integration paradigm. The idea is that you present an array of dots. Uh, is, this is a five times five array, and then after a delay, you present